Well, poddies, we are here. It's almost Halloween, uh, which makes me very excited. You know, sweets. Um, there is, I'm pretty sure, going to be another episode where I talk about the joys of Halloween because I do that most years. So don't worry, you are not there yet. And I'm not going to talk about Haribo and all of the great sweets that come out at this time of year. But it is a Friday. I'm feeling pretty good. Um, I'm actually recording this conversation on a Friday as well, which is always nice. Because sometimes when I'm recording episodes, I'm like, oh, it's Monday and it's not. It's like a Wednesday. <laughs> I feel really out of integrity about that. But I'm getting to have a conversation with one of my awesome clients, uh, colleagues, and a good friend of mine as well, the lovely Jen Hall. Um, and she is coming on the show today to talk about something that's really, really important about this premise of becoming a market leader in your industry. Now, this is something that we kind of talk about pretty regularly we've talked about thought leadership on the show we've talked about what it really means to dominate your market but in terms of actually becoming a market leader I think it can be quite a difficult concept so I was really glad that Jen said she'd come back on the show this is her third time as we discussed in the episode to talk about positioning yourself as a market leader some of the different ways that you can look at your own USP or in her words UMB the unique magic bullet and it's actually a really fun and interesting conversation there is a lot more laughing than normal <laughs> which I'm not not sure what that says about all my other guests obviously I love them dearly but it was just a really fun way to spend my Friday morning recording this for you guys I'm really hoping that you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed recording it um, there is a couple of other things as well this week we are getting close to some key points in the diary which is very exciting in just over three weeks, two weeks, two and a half weeks, I will be leading the Converting Corporates event in London. It's a two-day workshop uh, teaching people how to sell successfully to corporate organizations. Now, we at this stage have just 13 tickets left. So if you are considering coming, make sure you grab one of those 13 if you are wanting to attend in person. If you are travel limited, then we are offering a virtual attendee or a virtual delegate option. You can now grab that on the sales page, which is in the show notes below. We only have 30 spots for virtual delegates. We have already sold eight of those tickets. So there are officially at this point 22, that was quick maths in my head, <laughs> 22 virtual tickets left. So if you want to grab a ticket, but you haven't been able to sort out the travel or childcare, and you still want to get all of the juicy info on how to sell to corporate organizations, please make sure that you go and grab your virtual ticket now. The other thing is that during this episode, we talk about Jen's awesome expert and rivaled event which I'm actually speaking at. So I wanted to just highlight in the intro, if I do see any of you there, please come up to me. We're talking about podcasting at the event, or I'm talking about podcasting at the event, which I'm very, very excited about. So if you do have any questions about how I put together the content for the Smart Leader Sell podcast or the Selling to Corporates podcast, or you've got a question on setting up your own podcast, please make sure that you do come up to me at some point during the event and just ask away. That's what I'm there for as a speaker. So please make sure that if you are coming along to Expert and Rivaled in Cardiff on November 1st, that you just come up, ask me the question. I would always love to know when we've got fellow potties in the room and help you guys out as much as I can. Enjoy the conversation with Jen and I will look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Okay, poddies, how exciting is this? You guys haven't been privy to the off-screen recording, but uh, our guest today, Jen Hall, who I am absolutely privileged to be speaking at her Expert and Rivaled event in November this year, um, has just asked me if I would like her to run the entire podcast episode herself. So I'm just going to shut up and Jen's going to talk <laughs> for about 40 minutes. <laughs> Like, tell you all some really useful stuff but no seriously it's so good to have you back on the show this is your second time on the smart leader self podcast that's that's very cool i think it's third actually is it? yeah i think it's the third i'm lazy and on again i'm sure oh. there'll be a fourth hopefully yeah I like that. that's really good that means that you and heather gray are tied for oh. most appearances 
Nice. So technically, I'm expecting a really good pitch from one of you in 2020 to be like, right, I just, I'm racing forward with this. I've got to be the, the quadruple. Absolutely. On this. <laughs> Do I get like a medal or a trophy or something if that happens? I, I think we could arrange that. Yeah. I, I think it's <laughs> some kind of like bag of chocolate, you know, chocolate coins or something with your face on. And like Lovely. the logo on the back. I like that. I like that a lot. Or you could do a trophy, but it would mean I'd have to give it away to the next person who takes the lead, which would make me very sad, but it, it could work. I mean, so far, <laughs> nobody is catching up. Like, all I can remember is you and Heather. So, you're <laughs> 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 doing all right. Me again. <laughs> so, I am excited to have you back on, and I'm so excited to be speaking expert and live again. I, I feel like I should also get some That's kind of trophy true. for reappearing. Um, Absolutely nice little stage idea for you but tell us about expert and rival because i'm you know and, and i always say this to the people on the show like i love creating my podcast and you know it's the, the favorite content medium for me i really enjoy it i'm sat here in my uh, trackies at the moment recording this so glamorously with you in your like closet <laughs> um and it's just such a great medium to talk to people, to have chats with people, to make it feel really informal, but deliver lots of value. And so when you approached me about Expert and Rivaled and said, hey, could you do a talk on like podcasting and generating revenue and positioning yourself in the market through your podcast? I was like, this is the best talk I've been asked to do this year by far. So tell us about the event because it, it's, really, it's a really cool concept. I really like the, the actual theme of the event this year. Yeah, honestly, I'm really excited about it. And what you just said has made me beam. I'm so pleased because honestly, I mean, you have absolutely nailed the podcasting arena. So I'm really, really chuffed to have you there. But in terms of you were saying about, you know, podcasting being one of your favorite mediums, running live events is something that I absolutely love doing. Like I feed off it to the point where actually the next day I kind of come down on a massive low from a crash of the adrenaline and how exciting it is. Like nothing is in, like comes into comparison. I would like to say not even Christmas comes into comparison to running a live event. Honestly, it's such a buzz, you know, and, and not just running my own ones, but actually going to other, other people's events and things as well. I absolutely adore it because they're great networking situations I personally think because no one's going in there with their business cards gritted between their teeth forcing them down your throat you're all there for a common purpose and so it makes it a really nice place for kind of even mutual conversation that can absolutely turn into business but more than anything the reason I decided to do Expert on Rivaled um, in, in, in Cardiff as well because I really felt that South Wales has kind of been let down on the on the kind of <laughs> stages. I do, poor South Wales. Yeah, it's I always know. like in it. London because obviously I did. We did the Ricks last year, didn't we? No, I don't. Which, which was amazing. Um, <laughs> Exactly. I've swapped my crown for a vajazzle. Um, <laughs> and we're going it. We're going into South Wales. But no, honestly, I think South Wales really deserves this event because it's specifically around positioning. It's specifically around positioning yourself as a market leader. And, uh, and I really do believe that people are calling, particularly again in South Wales, people are calling themselves small businesses. But for me, it really undermines what people can deliver and the kinds of things that people are capable of. You know, small business doesn't mean small income. It doesn't mean small impact, you know? And I think there are so many businesses like that at the moment that are kind of stuck at a certain level and can't almost break through. And there are some very simple ways in which you, you can, act, anyone can do it if they focus, which has zero, unfortunately, zero connection to how good it is at what you do. And this is where I get really upset because there are so many talented people out there who aren't breaking through and can't see the connection between how great they are what they do and why they're not making it as a, as a market leader. So I want to show them things and um, like we discussed the other day, Jess, around building concrete USPs, around charging higher prices. And I know, obviously, me and you are on the same wave wavelength with that. Again, that comes down to charging, you know, what your results are worth versus what, yeah. you, think, what you think you're worth. Obviously, there has to be some logic and method behind the madness. But yeah, all of those things are really, really important to me. And so I wanted to bring together you know experts like yourself to come together to really share those nuggets that have allowed people to make 
success in, in admittedly a relatively short space of time and this is the thing is people think that you've got to be in business for like 10 15 years before you can make it as a market leader and it really isn't the case you, you're completely right i mean i will obviously take the mick out of south wales and if you listen and you are from south wales you know that i mean it in all good fun but the, honestly the only thing i ever knew about south wales was that gavin and stacy was kind of am I even absolutely right? they put it on the map <laughs> Barry, I, I've got that in my sights to visit at some point when it's not raining and horrible because I'm not, not good in that kind of weather. But I'd never heard that there was this thriving like business community down there Absolutely. until you became um, a client of mine. And, and when you started talking about all these networking events you were going to and, you know, all these small business owners that had developed like really strong close relationships and things, I was kind of like, there is nothing like that where I live, you know, in, in Southampton, we I think we probably all ignore each other. I mean, in my local <laughs> coffee shop, I'm sure it's full of business owners. We don't talk to each other. It's kind of like a mini London. <laughs> you know, we just all kind of sit there and look at each other's laptops enviously and be like, oh, look, do you know that so-and-so who drinks the latte every time has got a new MacBook Pro? How exciting. Um, <laughs> but it, it's that kind of thing, isn't it? And what I really love is that, you know, you're putting on this event talking about something that is so important that we forget. You know, when we set up businesses everybody talks about oh my website oh my branding oh my this you know ideal client avatar da, 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 da. what we forget about is how we actually positioning ourselves in the market and how we positioning ourselves as something or someone who has the potential to grow and evolve and become that leader within that space and i think that's really interesting because you know a lot of the business events that we see now are just teaching the same things and a lot of it let's be fair is inspirational i've been very fortunate this year to talk at some amazing events that have been very very practical but the reason they've been so successful like expert and rival will be is because ultimately they've got a very very key point or topic or theme that they want to cover off they're not trying to just do the whole lot so why positioning like why was that the big pull for you this year because again i believe that you know you can be great at what you do but unless you're focusing on positioning you're not going to break through so for me it was really important you know i'm i'm obsessed with niching i think it's really important the, the more specific you can get the more value you can deliver as far as i'm concerned and you know even when it comes to you know because you and i work together and you help me out with some of my messaging stuff you know we were having a conversation the other day about how i was writing something out and i was like this feels too broad and it means that i can't deliver what i want to deliver and what i'm saying and so when it comes to creating my events i want to make them as specific as possible to deliver that value and to make them as practical as possible so that it isn't just i mean inspiration is great and there is a massive place for it and i think it's it is definitely important but the reason why people come to my events is not necessary to be inspired that's almost like a side effect of, of coming to my events the main reason they come is to find practical valuable steps almost to help them get you know get on their way and actually reach that goal and i know that a lot of people who still in south in south wales and beyond across the board across the uk that there's a lot of people out there who want to break through that barrier and almost just don't know how to do it or they look at other people and go well you know how did they do it or they're lucky or they must have had a leg up and all of these things but the fact of the matter is is you guys have created your opportunities you've you know you've you've hard grafted it's not like this is something that's fallen into your lap you've done the groundwork and you've taken the steps and it's those things i want to be shared with the audience to share with the people that come to expert unrivaled because that is then going to allow them to to pick and choose as well because we were having another discussion around you know not everything that you're going to necessarily hear at expert unrivaled is something you should absolutely 100 percent do you know what's your saying about you know the you know inch and i say an inch deep got it wrong again with the fourth <laughs> <laughs> mile deep inch wide and so you've got to be you've, you've got to pick the right things for you but if you do that and you do it right you know you can make you can make that success to that market leader position because you know if you're a talented person you deserve more like you know market share and the only way you're going to do that is through marketing is through articulating what makes you different what makes you great and actually finding ways and methods and modalities to actually express that 
and that's i think you know that takes us into quite an interesting area and like i said we had this conversation the other day so for those of you who do not have to coach with me and have the the kind of pain of every month having to actually speak to me and and uh, be part of <laughs> That you must be doing X and Y. You you miss that that conversation between us around you know making sure that you tailor the advice to you, and you know one of the things that I've always admired about the way that you teach niching and the way that you're teaching your clients how to position themselves and how they are productizing their their own unique selling points is that unlike most people in the market you're not telling people oh well you're a health coach well you must fit into this box then you're a this coach so you must fit into that box and I think that it's really interesting because so often even when we talk about sales you know people often will buy into one particular strategy above all others and it's the one that maybe they see most often you know a few years ago it was webinars into discovery calls into sales Mm -hmm. Now it's challenges into webinars, into sales, then it will be, you know, back to something else that's, that's cool and innovative. The reality is anything works, but it's about having that focus and keeping that up, you know, and, and being really consistent about that. And I think it's really interesting because the one thing that doesn't really change around your business is this idea of positioning and knowing where you want to go and acting in a way that's going to help you get there and when I say acting obviously I don't mean fake it until you make it because that's not what we're talking about yeah Um, exactly but in in terms of you know doing the right activities at the right points in those journeys to make sure that you're establishing yourself as a market leader then you become that market leader and then you retain that Mm -hmm. position as market leader and we were having this really interesting discussion about like bigger companies the other day you sent me some great examples which I loved just as an FYI about companies who who have these amazing USPs that have not changed you know and that's the only real constant so you know tell us about that because is it a case of you know you you have to hit on the right thing and it's like lightning bolt from the sky moment you go oh my god this is my USP woohoo um (laughs) or you know, is there something else there? Because once once you've determined what that is, I don't personally see that it changes. No, absolutely not. It doesn't. It, it is. It's an evergreen thing. I mean, the, the only caveat to that is is that it, there is a potential for other people to to jump on the bandwagon. But the thing is, if you're the first, and we both know this, when you're the first, all of that's irrelevant because you're the one that becomes known for that thing. And everyone else doing it is kind of the second sloppy seconds. So if you can be the first at something, that is that is what you want to aim for. But I don't believe it's a bolt from the blue at all. You know, a lot of people do that. They kind of get this kind of go through this mode of clarity and then they they hit on something. And yes, it might be something to do with your USP, but it's not necessarily the thing. It's not something that's just going to fall out of the sky. Actual real USPs are innovated. One of the examples that I that I sent you, and I'm going to use an actual tangible product here because it's an easy way to to kind of explain as an example. But if we use a, the good old Apple example that everyone wheels out, that everyone understands that, so that's the main thing. But this time, I'm not going to use the actual brand as such. I'm talking about a physical computer, a Mac computer. And within that Mac computer, one of the reasons I switched from Microsoft to Apple, you know, strike me down, is because of their operating system, the OS Mac operating system. Now, that system is really interesting because there's debate out there saying, oh, you know, our PC's faster, our Mac's faster. And the reason I changed over is because, you know, I was told that Macs are faster because they have this OS Mac. Now, at the end of the day, it's my experience that it is faster. And I'm pleased with my decision. And I, you know, but that was the USP for me that changed everything, that particular thing. And this is the thing, a lot of people think that their system that they have thrown together is a USP. And I'm just kind of here just to kind of say, no, it's not. It's a mechanism within that system that is the thing. And this is where people you know, stumble across the system. They go, that's it, that's what makes me different. And you know, it's different, yes but unique doesn't always mean useful. And in order for your USP to be leveraged, it has to be an epiphany moment, almost that moment of understanding from your client's perspective where they go, oh my gosh, okay, so that's why. 
the OS Mac. That's why the MacBook works so well because of that operating system. I get it. It's that moment of understanding where they can put some kind of tangible logic around why that thing works because anyone essentially can put a system together but what is it within that that you can extract and you know pull out like that that operating system to say this is why this works and this is you know and do you know what the os mac operating system you can only get that from a mac mm -hmm. but going back to my point around the reason why i mentioned the debate around whether they're faster or not is because actually scientifically it's been proven that some pcs are actually faster but it's what you've told your market and it, it only has to be new to your market. And so it depends on the sophistication of your audience as to how long that USP will last for. Mm -hmm. So yes, it is evergreen, but it, as your business evolves and as your audience perhaps changes slightly, you do kind of, you have to be willing to adapt and willing to change. But I've created, you know, these solid concrete USPs in my business that are right for a particular person. And, th and that's the way it goes in business, right? You have to be clear on who it is you're speaking to, to design the right messaging, to design the right USP. And it is a design. You do innovate. It isn't the bolt up the blue. So a couple of things I want to pick up there that are really interesting. And the first thing is this, you can be unique but not useful mm -hmm. i really like that and you know have t-shirts made with it on is all i have to say on, on that <laughs> that's a good but idea for yeah, the event we're ready for that exactly. <laughs> but but i do in all seriousness i think that's a really really good point i think so often we look for the new you know and, and i i see this with my clients i see this with um people who listen to the podcast and the questions we get in from the Facebook group and things like that, where people go, how can I make myself different? And they're looking for how can I, you know, what they mean by different is how can I appear different to that competitor there so that people buy from me rather than looking at how can I be uniquely useful or provide a different experience or have a different process that works better for the person that I'm targeting. And I think that's a really, really, um, different understanding like it's not just enough to be different it's not enough to have a different colored branding it's not enough to just drop an f-bomb in your marketing anymore and that makes you a rebel like those things are just not enough anymore in terms of defining yourself as being different or being unique you know i like that it's actually coming back to a place of credibility right if you are uniquely useful then you're going to have way more of a chance to become successful. People are going to buy more into your brand, into your business, into what you're selling. So I really like that. But the other interesting point you raised there was about adapting and change. You know, and if we look at some businesses that have perhaps not been as successful over the years, um, and it's, especially in the online space, I always talk about this and I always joke about Periscope and how flat that fell after <laughs> you know, a relatively short period of time. It had, what, an 18-month shelf life? And that's not long, you know. But they had a USP, arguably, you know. Great, you can be live from your Twitter handle. Um, and, and you could sit there and it was like Big Brother. Some people would literally be scoping. I can't yeah, yeah. Like using that. <laughs> Thing, uh, so retro all day long and, and people just sit there and kind of watch them like eat their breakfast and, and, and do this kind of thing so what is it about some USPs and others that make some have this kind of longevity obviously there's, there's an aspect of like business planning and marketing and, and actually selling mm -hmm. and monetizing those platforms that goes into it but what's the difference between having a USP that is going to be able to be adapted and grow with you, with your business, with your audience versus having something that says, okay, yeah, you're different. Cool. Because that's what it struck me when you're talking about uniquely useful mm -hmm. is, oh, Periscope was different and it was novel and people used it because it was different and novel. But then it was just like, oh, well, Facebook Live was more convenient and easier and everyone was on it. And like, you know, what, what are your kind of thoughts around those USPs and that change? That is such, that's a really, really interesting question. And I, and I think it really does come down to adaptability. You know, you can't rest on your laurels with these things. You know, there, there are certain things that, that will be a flash in the pan unless you're willing to 
add, re, re innovate, and see how you can do it. Because as you said, you know, basically we've taken Periscope and we've put it on a platform. Do you, do you know what I like it to? It's like when people try and be different and they try and take the community off Facebook. No, it yeah. rarely works. It rarely works because you know Facebook has dominated community it's dominated that and so everybody uses that for ease of use so this is the thing is that you it has to be convenient you have to think about your audience and what and what they want and if what you've got is no longer convenient you have to sort of keep up potentially even you know collaborate if we take periscope as the example you know the they, you have to kind of keep your eye out there. You, you either have to change or you have to collaborate with others who can help facilitate that change. And you know what? The thing is, we're talking a lot here about, you know, real kind of tangible techie, you know, OS Max and things like that. When we take it back to, you know, people who we're talking to, service-based businesses, coaches, consultants, you know, 90% of people don't have, don't have a tangible USP. And that and that's the problem. And you know, taking it right back to kind of the basic level, and so many people use themselves as the USP. Mm -hmm. and the problem is you, you can't you can't scale that. You cannot scale it. And most of the time, it's not unique, and nor is it useful. Or have it, like you said, I've got like a, I'm, I'm a rebel. I've got a kooky personality. I'm creative. None of that is unique. And depending on what you're doing for your ideal client, it's not necessarily that useful to them. So I think to create a a, a USP, a concrete one that has that longevity, you do have to, you have to create something that is in, in line, almost like a class, it's almost like a classic, it has to be a classic, something that will, that will stand the test of time. And I really don't think that it's something that you can articulate as such, and, and this will be a challenge for me to go away and actually have a look at. But there are some, like the OS Mac op operating system. But I think, obviously, as we know, that the PCs are, are working faster. So if we look at the OS Mac, for instance, they're going to have to improve it. They're going to have to re-innovate it at some point. Otherwise, this reputation that they've got will fall flat. You know, you have to put the, like you said, put the integrity back behind it. So you have to be willing to adapt. You do have to be willing to change things as time goes on. I think that is what will keep that alive versus letting it die out. And it is interesting. I always think like one of the biggest, I mean, I watched Bohemian Rhapsody recently, so this could be uh, where the influence is coming from. I really liked it. Just as <laughs> everyone listening, you should watch it. Also Green Book, much preferred that, but Bohemian Rhapsody was fine, like good. Um, but I was watching it and it was interesting because there is this um, amazing scene and I've actually got it, uh, the quote here, because I genuinely really quite liked it. There's this amazing scene and Freddie Mercury sits there and they're talking about the Bohemian Rhapsody song and the producer guy is sat there and he's like this is the most ridiculous thing that we've ever heard you've got opera in it you've got rock you've got this you've got that like it's too much it's six minutes long nobody's going to listen for six minutes on the radio and he says to Freddie and obviously the rest of the band but nobody ever like kind of remembers that bit but he says to Freddie look there is a certain formula to make radio work for you and to get your number one and freddie mercury turns around him in this like incredible sparkly jacket giving zero f's about it and just says formulas are a complete waste of time and if you look at queen you know in their music and the reason that they are just even today still in the charts you know when that film got re-released back up they were you know absolutely but it was because ironically they were following a formula the usp was to have no formula was to break the barriers was to you know completely break up what people expected of music and to mm -hmm. create something completely different that anybody could find appealing in, in some way shape or form and so it's it's really interesting how even though formulas might seem like the waste of time ultimately that formula whatever that is for you even if it is throw the formula away mm -hmm. it works you know it's exactly. about having your process that's going to work for you and ultimately for your customers and i think that's it's quite an interesting thing so let's talk about market leadership because again we, we're in a space you know i joked about buzzwords earlier but we are in that space where everybody's talking about thought leadership now market leadership authenticity you know scaling growth and 
when we talk about these words, you know, I people say to me sometimes, oh, Jess, how do you expect your business to scale over the next year? And I'm kind of like, <laughs> I love that. Um, <laughs> and I just kind of sit there and I'm like, well, you know, maybe we'll uh, you know, chuck, some, chuck some more money into advertising. Ooh. Um, but of course, that's not really what people mean. What people actually mean when they ask that question is just, you know, how do you anticipate you're going to make more money next year? Or what do you anticipate you're going to go in and move into? Or what are you going to talk about? So what is market leadership like what does that actually mean what are, what do people mean when they say i want to be a market leader what does that actually look like okay so well a lot of a lot of the time the biggest reason is because they want to be the number one choice in their market when it comes for instance we're talking about making money here and making an impact that for them and for me in particular is about becoming that number one choice that says i don't really want to go anywhere else when i come across you there is no point looking anywhere else. It's about making a splash in your industry, getting all the opportunities, the best opportunities, pay gigs on the best stages, podcast in interviews with the best podcast interviewers, such as Jessica Lorimer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for that later. <laughs> <laughs> Shoehorn that one in. <laughs> it's about getting quoted by industry recognized platforms. It's all of these things that, and, and I'm going to talk about this in, in, a, in a way in terms of significance and about recognition. Um, and I've had feedback before when I've used those terms that it's very egotistical to, to, to kind of do that. It should be about making an impact. And yes, absolutely. I think we should absolutely be serving the world because if we're not, then we don't have a business at the end of the day. If you're not solving problems, you're not going to get recognized. And the first place that you need to get recognized is with your clients for the people who, you, who you're working for the people who you help but you also in order to make it as a market leader it's really important and important to me and important to other people if they really admit it to get that recognition from the industry which also enables them to scale in that way to make more money because when you can leverage those platforms that already have those bigger audiences who are you know voices of reason within your market if you're able to help them see why you are groundbreaking, why you are cutting edge, what's different about you and why this is going to make such a big difference in the industry. If you can do that, then yes, it makes you feel good. Yes, it gives you that recognition, but inevitably off of the back of that significance and recognition, it will automatically allow you to make that impact. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because, and I, I spend quite a lot of time saying to people, you know, always prioritize your money making activities because ultimately if you aren't selling you have a very expensive hobby and that is completely true you know and there are lots of people who write into the show and some people say yeah I completely believe that Jess and other people say I really hate you for saying that and those people I'm assuming don't listen anymore afterwards <laughs> but when we talk about being a market leader especially when we talk about like recognition and impact and being on the best stages and the podcasts and you know in industry publications it's always interesting because I find that sometimes people prioritize those things so much that they forget about monetization. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I love about your approach is that obviously, you know, what you say is in order to become the market leader, you have to be making the money. It's not, it, it's not an exclusive thing. You can't just have impact in order to consider yourself a market leader. You have to be also generating the revenue that's going to support that future growth and market share ultimately. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think that, you know, making money is validation that it's wanted, mm -hmm. you know, it, you know, other, otherwise, otherwise you are a charity and that's great. But at the end of the day, if we're creating things that are really going to change the world, if we want to be grandiose about it, then people will want to pay money, not have to pay money, but people will want to spend their money on it. And if you've got that validation, then you've got some integrity. And this is, and this is the thing where you find that people who supposedly kind of reach some kind of publicity stage and they're you know they're out there and their name's big but they're a flash in the pan because there's nothing there's no substance behind it there's no real true believers or following and you're only going to get real true believers and following and advocates with people who are willing to part with cash to pay for what you're offering because they value it and it is interesting because again you know to take it back to technology the biggest thing that I thought would be a flash in the pan, which now makes me seem like a complete idiot, <laughs> is uh, those Apple AirPods. 
I was like, this is the most ridiculous thing. Like, you can't even use them for sports. If anyone does use them for sports, please write in and tell me how useful they are. Maybe I'll buy a pair now. But I, I honestly didn't get why people were spending, what is that, £150 on a pair of earphones that you will put them on your coffee table and lose one for sure yeah. and then we'll spend another 150 pounds buying two more to do exactly the same thing repeatedly throughout your life until you die like what is the point in that <laughs> the, the whole thing about it was that you know obviously apple people who work for apple are much 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 smarter and they know their customers much better than i do you know and ultimately their thing was we know that the biggest bugbear for our audience is wires around the neck trying to get wires on and off if you are somebody who walks to work off the tube you don't want to get the wire wet so you end up threading it through your coat and then it's all over the place and they knew that people wouldn't mind paying the repeat cost of losing them yep that's just going to happen but it's so interesting that at no point have they been apologetic with that usp at no point as the market leader have they gone oh well we're really sorry that if you you know if you can't be bothered to look after your stuff properly you're probably going to lose two or three pairs before you get the hang of putting them back in the box every time and and you know keeping them somewhere safe instead they've they've said to people buy these they're brilliant they do exactly what you want and if you are daft enough to lose them then guess what you get to pay us another 150 pounds or yeah. however much it is when inflation goes up Absolutely. And there you go. You've got a recurring product that is extremely high end because, you know, for a product of that, like you said, it's, it is expensive, but if people want it, they will, they, they will pay for it. And, and I think that is the, the best validation you can get that what you've got is something really worth sharing, talking about. And it's, and just as I wanted to mention earlier, we were saying about the whole kind of being you is, is, is not necessarily enough as a USP. For me, I mean, Jay Bear was on your podcast a little while ago. He was talking about talk triggers, which I absolutely have a little bit of a crush because he's just amazing. If I could marry his mind, that would be oh. brilliant. Um, and his, and if you guys haven't read Talk Triggers, make sure you do. It's a brilliant book. Um, but for me, there is a big difference between a talk trigger and a USP or a UMB, as I call it, that unique magic bullet, which is about productizing that USP. You know, and I think those things have to work together. You know, sometimes you're lucky enough to, to stumble upon one again, which is why I was saying earlier, it's very hard to articulate this sometimes because there are no hard and fast rules. And sometimes you're lucky enough to stumble on something that is a talk trigger where it's shareable and then a uh, something that's extremely useful. And my gosh, if you stumble across that, you hold on to that for dear life. And I truly believe that that's something, for instance, that will outlast. Um, you know, out, outlast the market. That will be something that is truly, truly evergreen. But uh, but you do have to recognise that just because something is talked about doesn't necessarily mean that it's compelling enough to spend a lot of money on. And for me, that's where the unique selling point mm. is really important. So many people focus on the unique instead of the selling point, and it's making that focus back on the selling point that really puts the integrity back in behind what you're doing and really pushes that forward to for for it to be industry recognized i agree i really like that thank you so much for sharing all this today seriously i know i know that people who are listening are like okay these are a lot of big concepts because they are you know when we're talking about especially usp and market leadership and things like that they're not always tangible it's not always easy to understand a what it actually is and b how you're going to get there as a business owner and I always think the, the other part of that is that it's not always easy to understand why you need to sell to get mm -hmm. to that point. Like, why is it relevant? You know, why can't we just have a good PR campaign, become really famous and, you know, make a ton of money? And like you said today, it doesn't happen that way. And if we look at the, you know, the kind of flash in the pans, we had that, what, Rebecca Black, who sang that Friday song. Anyone remember that? I don't, oh, I think it's, it's really Faith Bell. Yeah, her parents paid for her to pretend to drive a car at 13 and sang a song. Yeah. It was viral, like, it's huge. And then, where is she now? Like, where are you, Rebecca? Like, I personally actually did not think that song was as bad as a lot of people said, but, you oh, know. No, I'm listening to it after this. Yeah, <laughs> it was epic, but you have that in comparison to other things that have gone viral but that have you know lasted um if you look at and it's it's quite a tragic example but um there's that lady katie piper um who is now married has a different surname can't remember what that is but she had acid 
thrown on her face. It was like the first yeah. big case in the UK. She was, you know, out doing nothing, mind your own business. She had acid thrown in her face and she had to have a huge amount of facial reconstruction. And it was something that was hugely talked about, but she used that platform to ultimately go out there and talk about empowerment of young women. She's used that platform to talk about overcoming disabilities. She's used that platform to talk about, you know, how people look differently and how we should be improving like modeling campaigns and things. That's something that's lasted for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, Rebecca Black hit consider this your shout out for the week or month or however long the kind of fame lasts. It just didn't because it was a flash in the pan. It wasn't, strong enough to stand the test of time absolutely no i completely agree 100 percent. thank you and i'm excited so tell us where people can find more gen when where can they get more gen in their lives if they want to talk about unique magic bullets usps market leadership or anything else to do with the whole niching clarity experience First and foremost, it's get your ticket to Expert Unrivaled, which yeah. is the 1st of November um, this year, 2019. Um, and that's in Cardiff in the Jury's Inn. So make sure you grab your ticket because, you know, I'm going to be talking about more about um, these unique magic bullets, you, uh, concrete USPs, productization, looking at your positioning, your pricing. We've got you on podcasting. We've got audience buildings, speaking careers. We've got all the things to help you position yourself as a market leader. So do make sure you grab your ticket and do it quick. If you're quick enough, it might, you might catch it before the price goes up as well. So go and find it there. It's, if you just search on Expert Unrivaled on Eventbrite, that will pop up. Um, and you can go and grab your ticket on there. Um, otherwise, you can come and join me over in Unrivaled Experts in my Facebook group where we're celebrating all things um, about the event and all things market leadership. Amazing, amazing. And if you do turn up to Expert Unrivaled, make sure you come up and see me on the day. We all know that I'm a bit introverted. So, you know, give me time to have a coffee beforehand. But after that, I'm good to go. <laughs> I will have a whole day of peopling and speaking. And it's, it's going to be very, very exciting. I'm very excited to be there. Honoured to be back for the second time. So if you haven't got your ticket yet, please make sure you do head over onto Eventbrite. Get onto searching for Expert Unrivaled. Um, Jenna's brought in so many amazing guests and I'm genuinely really excited for the talks because they are so niche they are so diverse so I'm really looking forward to learning some things on the day as well and if you can't make it then go over to Unrivaled Experts the Facebook group and you can find all things Jen there thank you so much for coming on the show I really appreciate it again thank you so much thank you again yes thank you so much it's been fab I've really enjoyed this it's a privilege right if you have enjoyed today's episode please make sure you head over onto social media tell us how we did tell us what your key takeaway was from today's episode you can find both jen and i over on instagram neither of us does masses on there if we're honest but it's probably the easiest place uh, to share what your key takeaway is these days over on the gram because you know facebook just still is not lighting me up i will see you in monday's episode